Well, good morning and welcome to worship. So thrilled that you chose to join us this morning. Today we will be continuing in our sermon series on the journey, where we are actually taking a journey through the Bible. And in many ways, it is the journey of a lifetime. As we begin, I would invite you to join with me as we go to our Lord in prayer. Father, as we come into your presence, we acknowledge that we desperately need you. We need you in all ways. So Lord, we come before you right now asking that your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts, in our lives. You will illuminate our minds and you will guide and direct us in truth. Lord, we ask that as we are gathered, that we will sense your presence, that we will know that we have truly worshipped you today. As I come, O Lord, I ask for your cleansing, that you would make me a vessel fit for your use. For I acknowledge my transgressions. I ask that you would thoroughly wash me, make me clean through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ask for the anointing power of your spirit. For I know I cannot teach this in the flesh, that I'm absolutely dependent upon you. And so, Lord, we give ourselves up before you. And it's in that precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Well, we are on a journey, a pilgrimage through the Bible. And last week we began our journey by looking at a panoramic view of the Old Testament. And we began that journey by asking a simple question. What is the purpose of the Bible? And God gave us the Bible so that we might know Him. Now, that means we need the entire Bible. We can't just pick and choose the parts we like. We can't decide that something is more important than something else and just completely ignore it. We can't say that we don't need the New Testament or that we don't need the Old Testament. If we start picking and choosing the parts of the Bible we like, at best, we will have an inaccurate and an incomplete view of God. But what's even more dangerous is if we're picking and choosing the parts that we like, what we end up doing is having an image of God that we have created in our image. And so if we're going to truly know God, if we're going to have the complete picture, then we are going to need the entire Bible so today, as we continue our journey, we're going to narrow down our panoramic view just a little bit. We're going from that panoramic view of the Bible today to where we're focusing in on a panoramic view of the Old Testament. And one of the most powerful passages found in the Bible that emphasizes the importance of the Old Testament is actually found in the New Testament. It's in Luke's account of the Gospel in chapter 24. And the events that are taking place there are right after the resurrection of Jesus. And one of those post-resurrection appearances takes place while two men are on a road. The road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And as they are walking along, they're talking about what has happened, that is the arrest of Jesus, his trial, his crucifixion, 
and the fact that now his tomb is empty and they do not know where he is, when they are suddenly joined by a stranger. Now the stranger is Jesus, but yet his likeness is kept from them recognizing him. And as they walk along, they begin discussing the events that have taken place. And then it turns into a walking seminar. Jesus is talking to them, and I can just see them as they walk along. They're in no hurry to get to Emmaus. They'll be talking, and then Jesus will be saying something, and they will just stop and listen because it's too important to continue the walk. And at the end of the day, they've reached Emmaus. Jesus has left them. And here is their summary of the events of that day. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And that is powerful. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us? It's the kind of passage when I read it, I have to ask, what caused this awe-inspiring sensation? What is it that made their hearts burn within them? And it was nothing more and nothing less than Jesus explaining the Old Testament to them. In Luke 24, 27, it says, Beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was in all the scriptures concerning himself. That's it. You see, that's exactly what the Old Testament does, is it points to Christ. It prepares our hearts to receive the one that is promised, to receive the one who satisfies the longings of our heart and our soul and our life. And that's what happened on the road to Emmaus. You see, Jesus isn't just the subject of the New Testament. Jesus is also the focus of the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus said the same thing to some Jewish leaders who were opposing him. In John 5, he said, You diligently study the Scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. Now listen to this. These are the Scriptures that testify about me. In his post-resurrection appearance there on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus opened up the scriptures to them, the Old Testament, he was showing them everything that Moses and the prophets had said about him. When he confronts these religious leaders, he tells them that the scriptures, the Old Testament, is all about him. We can't unhitch from the Old Testament because it's all about Jesus. Now, as you read through the Old Testament and as you study it, one of the things you'll probably discover along the way is that the Old Testament is a deliberately incomplete book. You see, the Old Testament was never intended to be God's final word. And so as you're reading through the Old Testament, one of the things that you will probably see right out as it begins is the unfulfilled promises. You have all of these remarkable predictions that someone is coming. They begin in Genesis. And as you read through the Old Testament, the predictions of this person are growing in detail and in the degree of anticipation, looking for the coming one. Until finally you get into the prophets, and they just explode in their description of the coming one. And yet, after you've ran through the entire Old Testament, you've ran through the last book, Malachi, you still do not know who that person is. 
See, the Old Testament is a book of unfulfilled promises. And as you continue to read the Old Testament and as you study it and you read through it, the next thing that you may discover is that it is a book of unexplained sacrifices. Right off of the bat, right there in the beginning of Genesis, you notice this disturbing stream of blood that begins to flow. And the volume increases throughout the Old Testament. And it's the blood of the sacrifices. Thousands upon thousands of them. And the message is driven home. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And as you read through the entire Old Testament and you finally come to the book of Malachi once again, we realize that the Old Testament is a book of unexplained sacrifices. As you read through this Old Testament and as you study it, you'll discover that it is a book of unsatisfied longings. The great men and the great women of the Old Testament were looking for something more. Something more than this life has to offer. They're looking for something transcendent. They're looking for something eternal. Perhaps it's best described with what Abraham experienced. Because it says that he was looking for a city whose architect and builder was God. There's that longing for something more. Throughout the Old Testament, the people of Israel were on a pilgrimage. They're looking for something more. And then you look in the book of Job and Psalms, and you look in Solomon's writings with the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and there's this continual cry from thirsty souls longing for something that is yet to be realized. And by the time you get to Malachi, we sense that there is this unsatisfied longing. See, as you read through the Old Testament, it's a book of unfulfilled promises, unexplained sacrifices, unsatisfied longings. But something happens The moment you cross over into the New Testament, there is this amazing, unbelievable fulfillment. Matthew opens with the words, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Right off of the bat, here's the person that we've been looking for. Here's the one who fulfills the promises. Here's the one who explains the sacrifices. Here's the one who satisfies the very longings of our heart and our soul. And it's Jesus alone who does that. And so it's in the New Testament that it fulfills the promises of the Old Testament. And if we're really going to fully appreciate the New Testament, if we're really going to understand the New Testament, if we're really going to see that Jesus is the promised one, we have to be awakened by the message of the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament that is intended to prepare us for something. In fact, we find that in the book of Hebrews in the first chapter. Beginning with verse 1, he says, In the past, now let's just pause right there. In the past, he's talking about in the Old Testament. And so, in the past, in the Old Testament, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, In other words, the days of the New Testament. He has spoken to us by His Son. There it is. The Old Testament and the New Testament permanently hitched. And Jesus is the subject of both of them. 
And did you notice how he said God spoke in the Old Testament at many times and in various ways? Let's just consider that. Let's look through some of the Old Testament and see how God has spoken in the past. And in Genesis, we have the account of the creation. And then we have the fall, the flood. God has spoken already in many ways, and that's followed by the narratives of the patriarchs. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But as you continue reading in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you have the thundering of the law. God speaking in a different way. But yet he continues to do that because then it's followed by the drama of history. And then we have the sweet hymns and sorrowful laments in the Psalms. You have the wisdom of Proverbs. You have the tenderness of Ruth and Esther and the Song of Solomon. God speaking in many ways. You have the visionary mysteries of Daniel and Ezekiel. So what he's talking about in Hebrews in the past, God spoke in many and various ways, and he's expressing that single truth so that we might know God. And it's through the promised one. And yet, when you get to the end of the Old Testament, it's still incomplete. It's a book of preparation. We've just gone through Advent. Advent is a time of preparation. And that's what the Old Testament is. It is a preparation for what's going on in the New Testament. Just like with Advent, it's a preparation for the coming of Christ. Not only celebrating His first coming and His birth, but preparation and reminding us that Jesus is coming again and we need to have our hearts ready. And so you might ask, well, why do I want to spend all of this time on preparation? I mean, why not go right to the New Testament? Why not go straight to the heart of the message? And when we think about it, every successful process requires preparation. Think about this. If you're a farmer, why not just go straight to the harvest? Why spend all of that time getting the equipment ready and planting the fields and, and, and weeding the fields and fertilizing the fields? I mean, why not just go straight to the harvest? And of course, if you're a farmer, you think, well, that would be great, but that's not going to work. The preparation is extremely important. Well, we could say the same thing even with education. I mean, instead of studying the ABCs and all of these rudimentary things here, why don't we just go straight to college? And we know that's ridiculous. It's, it's not going to work. And we cannot fully grasp the New Testament without the Old Testament. Paul sums it up in the book of Galatians in chapter 3. He says, so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. In other words, if I do not wrestle with the unyielding demands of the law, I will never understand why I need a Savior. But when I begin wrestling with those unyielding demands of the law, I begin to realize just how unrighteous I am. I begin to realize how incapable I am of keeping that law. And I begin to realize I need someone to save me. That's exactly what he was saying in the passage. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. Because it's then that we can be justified by faith. It's the Old Testament that sets our hearts aflame. They burn in anticipation and in longing for the Christ. And it's in the Old Testament that we find the deep, soul-searching questions of our heart 
gathered into one place. It's in the Old Testament that we see all of the pain, the anguish, the confusion that afflicts our soul. It's in the Old Testament that we deal with the age-old questions. Why is there injustice? Why do the wicked prosper? Well, it even becomes more personal. Why am I here? What's the purpose of my life? Am I loved? Am I valued? And it even deals with the question, or is just everything futile? See, all of this is to prepare us for the answer in the New Testament. And the answer is Jesus. As we look in the Old Testament, we'll discover that there are four major divisions. And each one of those divisions is designed to prepare us, to prepare us for a relationship with the Christ. See, each one of those divisions lays a foundation of truth. It's the same truth, but it lays it in a different way so that it speaks to our hearts in a different way. Each one of those divisions will touch our heart in a different way. Each one of them presents the ministry and the coming of Jesus in a different light. And all of that is so that when we see Him, we will recognize immediately that He is the one. That Jesus is the one that the Old Testament has been talking about all along. He is the one who fulfills the prophecies. He's the one who explains the sacrifices. He's the one who satisfies the very longings within our heart. And so as you begin looking at those four divisions, the first one has several names that's been given to it. In scholarly circles, they may be known as the Pentateuch. Oh, it's a creative word. It just means five scrolls. It's the five books. It's also known as the Torah or the law. Or if you're actually reading in the Bible, it's more often referred to as the books of Moses. And those first five books are really five steps to maturity. They take us from the origin of the universe and the beginnings of humanity and they lead us towards maturity. It's here that we find the origin of sin, God's judgment in the flood. We have the birth of the nation of Israel, their captivity, and their wandering in the wilderness right up to the border of the promised land. And in that first division, the very first book is Genesis. And it simply means beginning. And the book opens with the greatest mystery of our existence. And its stories are a reflection of our greatest need. Think about the stories. Right there in Genesis, you have the story of Adam and Eve. And they needed a covering for their sin. Noah needed a boat to save him from the waters of judgment. Abraham continually needed God to intervene and deliver him and supply what he was lacking. Isaac needed God to prod him into action. And Jacob... Jacob needed a savior to get him out of all the messes that he seemed to get himself into in his life. And Joseph needed a deliverer. You see, that's it. Genesis presents our greatest human need. We've sinned. Judgment is coming. We need a deliverer. We need a savior. And then when you come to the book of Exodus... You define God's response to our human need. 
because its message is one of the redemptive power of God in our life. In the book of Exodus, we encounter the very first Passover. We have the parting of the sea. We have the law giving at Sinai. And in the book of Exodus, we encounter the story of human oppression and bondage and God's miraculous redemption and deliverance. And as you read through it, you discover the people of Israel had nothing to do with bringing about their salvation. God did it all. You see, that's God's response to our human need. He brings redemption and deliverance. It's a message of how He continues to work in our lives today. In Leviticus, it is a book of detailed instructions. And it begins with the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God. And the tabernacle is a symbol. It's a picture of our lives because we are ultimately where God wants to dwell. He wants your heart and mine to be His tabernacle, to be His dwelling place. And Numbers is a book of human failure. It's kind of ironic. You can just count them. And it begins at the edge of the promised land. And we find the people wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, all because they lost sight of God's promises, only to arrive back at the place where they began. You see, Numbers is a record of failure, and it stands as a warning for our own lives as well. And then you come to Deuteronomy. It means second law. And so the book of Deuteronomy is a re-giving of the law and the people's recommitment to follow it. In other words, Deuteronomy is a book of second chances. And it closes with this tremendous blessing that await those who follow God's pattern for their lives. And so these five books take us step by step through maturity toward living in a relationship with God. Then we come to the second division. And it's the message of history. And it's the books of Joshua through Esther. And these 12 books present the perils that confront us in our daily walk of faith. And it does so by tracing the history of one nation, one nation chosen by God to represent Him to the world. One nation chosen to perpetrate the lineage of the promised one. And so in the pressures and the perils, and the failures of Israel, we see ourselves. And in God's loving discipline and gracious redemption of Israel, we see His grace to save us from our sin. The book of Joshua presents the battles that the people faced as they seek to obey the Lord and to claim the promised land. And their leader, Joshua, marches on, never quitting, never turning aside from the mission that God assigned him. Boy, that's relevant for today, isn't it? And then in the Judges, we have a cycle of spiritual decline and spiritual renewal. And we see that taking place as God uses seven special people to bring deliverance to Israel. And Ruth, Ruth is a story of faithfulness. She's an outsider, an alien, and she hears the voice of God. And she obeys, and she joins herself to God's people. 
and Samuel and Kings and Chronicles. They tell the glory that's for the nation when the leaders follow God and the disasters and tragedies when they disobey God. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther deal with Israel's captivity and their restoration, reminding us that God is always at work in our lives. He lifts us out of defeat. He helps us rebuild our lives. Just as He lifted Israel out of defeat and rebuilt the walls of the city. And in these 12 books, God is preparing our hearts for the long-awaited Messiah. The third division we come to in the Old Testament is music to live by. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. And they're all poetic expressions of praise and protest. They expose our hearts to God. Those books express our pain and our longing for God. In fact, they express every single emotion that we can ever have. They are a reflection of our soul. And the fourth division you come to is the promises of God. Isaiah through Malachi. And they are a record of what God says He will do. And these 17 books are categorized in two ways. They're called the major prophets and the minor prophets. And that has nothing what to do with their importance or significance. In fact, it's all about length. The major prophets are longer books. The minor prophets are shorter books. It sort of be like if you're thinking about sermons. I mean, what do you think I would be, a major prophet or a minor prophet? And all of these books contain powerful major truths for our lives. Isaiah is a book of incredible glory and majesty. And it gives a detailed description of the life and the ministry and the sacrificial death of Jesus. It is a book of grace and new beginnings. And then you have Jeremiah in his second book, Lamentations. And they warn about God's absence when we turn our back on Him. Ezekiel begins with a transcendent vision of God and leads us on a tour of future history, revealing God's promise of divine intervention. Daniel. Daniel shows us God's protective power. And then he goes on to reveal what God's planning to do. Jose is a picture of unconditional love. As Jose pursues his wayward wife to bring her to redemption, that's a picture of God pursuing us to bring us to redemption. And Joel shows us how God takes the tragedies of life and He turns them into something different and uses them for His eternal purpose. And Amos. Amos is the prophet that reminds us that God never lowers His standards. He never relaxes those standards. And Obadiah is the promise of spiritual victory. And it's seen in a contrast to two brothers, Esau and Jacob, one representing the flesh and the other the spirit. And Jonah, Jonah is the story of second chances. Micah is the promise of God's pardon. Nahum promises judgment upon Nineveh because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and then they relapsed right back into their disobedience. Habakkuk tells us that ultimately God will answer our cries 
for justice in an unjust world. And Zephaniah is the promise of judgment on the day of the Lord. Haggai promises restoration when we turn our hearts to God. And Zechariah is the apocalypse of the Old Testament. It's promising God's management of future events and the preservation of God's people in the time of judgment. And Malachi promises that God will respond to our need and send a Savior. And he not only predicts the first coming of Jesus, he predicts his second coming as well. The more we know about the Old Testament, the more the message of the New Testament will burn in our hearts. The Old Testament is a deliberately incomplete book with unfulfilled prophecies, unexplained sacrifices, unfulfilled longings, all preparing us for the message of the New Testament. The Old Testament is the promise. And the New Testament is the promise fulfilled. The Old Testament as well as the New Testament is all about Jesus. He is the focus of the entire Bible. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you asking that as we study and as we go on this journey, as we look at the promises of the Old Testament, Lord, that just as those two men experienced on the road to Emmaus. May our hearts burn within us. May it come alive, showing us exactly all that you planned for us by sending your Son. We thank you, O Lord, for our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray, Lord, that we will grow deeper in our relationship with you through Christ. And it's in that precious name of our Lord that we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we will also be celebrating communion together. So give me just a moment to move this. So if you have your elements at home, this would be a really good time to gather those up. It was on the very last evening of our Lord's life. And he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. And that evening, he used that opportunity to show how the Old Testament and the New Testament were hitched. Because the Passover was all about him. He had shared with them that he had a tremendous desire to share in this Passover with them. And Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. There was order throughout the evening, but Jesus changed all of that up. Because on that evening, when he took the bread... He said something different. This bread is my body. They've been celebrating the Passover for nearly 1,400 years. Every time they picked the bread up, it was about Jesus. And then he blessed it. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the bread that came down out of heaven. Not as our fathers ate in the wilderness and died, but that whoever eats this bread lives forever. 
We thank You, O Lord, for the bread of life. The promised one who was born in Bethlehem. The city of bread. We thank You for our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. And then He broke the bread. As within a few hours, his body would be broken on a cross. After that, he took the cup. Likely it was the cup of redemption. But once again, Jesus surprises his disciples. And he said, this cup is my blood in the new covenant. And he blessed it. O Lord, we know from your word that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. We know from the thousands upon thousands of sacrifices, the blood flowing through the Old Testament, that not one drop of that blood to cleanse us of our sin. We thank you for the one that John identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, knowing that every one of those sacrifices was pointing straight to Jesus Christ who would pour out His blood for the forgiveness of our sin. Amen. And after that, Jesus invited his disciples to partake. The body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for loving us and wanting us to have a personal relationship with you. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life so that we might know you. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. I hope to see you back here next week.